Toddlers can go downstairs. You're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll spend our day there today. A welcome to any of our guests that are with us. If you're with us online as a guest, we welcome you as well. And we would love to meet you in person sometime. If you'd like to come join us, we'd be happy to have you. Before I begin, can I speak candidly to you, family? Every week as you come here, it's our goal as a leadership team, and it's my goal as a pastor, to host an atmosphere that is conducive to you meeting the Lord or spending time with the Lord uh, here on Sunday morning. So if, if you don't know him, we want to introduce him to you. And if you do know him, we want you to grow in him. And one of the challenges that I have as a pastor is speaking a message, particularly to those of you who have been coming here for longer than I've been alive, that keeps you engaged every week. And there may be times that particularly my longtime saints may hear things you've heard before. Um, There may be weeks where the message is a rehash of things you already know, and there may be weeks where you just don't get as much out of it as you do in other weeks. I need to ask you two favors. One, I need, I need to ask you to trust that the Lord is speaking to someone in those times, even if he's not particularly just speaking to you that day. And number two, that the repetition of information is good for you. Because rather distressingly, I've been told that you are going to forget 90% of what I say by Tuesday. <laughs> that really irritates me, especially... <laughs> considering how much work I put into this to try and be entertaining. Um, Exactly. (laughs) On the other hand, it does seem to say that I could preach the same message nine times in a row until you got it all, so maybe I should do less work, but I don't know. (laughs) But we have generations coming up that need to hear information that you may already know. And I sure hope we have believers who have new life, who are going to hear this information for the first time, and they need to hear it. So I ask you two things. Number one, be patient in those times, and, and pray, for that, pray for them. If, you, if you're not getting as much out of it today, pray for the person who is hearing the information for the first time, and be thankful for that. Be thankful for that. And I will do my best not to put you to sleep. I see it when you're you know, somewhere else or half asleep or fully asleep. I may have to talk, but I can still see you. So I'll try not to do that as much as I can, okay? We work together that way. I just needed to say that as the first Sunday that is not uh, a holiday. We had Palm Sunday. We had Easter Sunday. Thank you, Mel, for that. I thanked you last week. I don't know if you're watching, but great. So we're getting into the first message where we're not in a holiday. And, uh, Back in January, when, when you guys voted on, on that, and, and we, we talked about what I saw as God doing in the church, and I talked about uh, what I believe he's doing in this church is, is creating an atmosphere for growth, and we talked about the analogy of having a greenhouse. I don't know if you remember that. It's January, so you certainly don't remember it. We talked about having a greenhouse and, and God creating an atmosphere in his church for growth, and we talked about the first thing we need is a firm foundation. If you're going to build a greenhouse, you need a firm foundation. You're going to build any building, you need a foundation. And we talked about this being our foundation uh, from Matthew chapter 7 and the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And so it seems only fitting that as we step into my first series of messages uh, that the Lord is, has directed me to talk about how we know this is a foundation. I'd lo- like to talk about how we know this is sure and reliable over the next few weeks. If we're going to have a foundation, it seems like we should start there. So turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read the whole chapter. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, 
be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt and sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth just as Janez and Jambres oppose Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are just as with Janez and Jambres. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what purpose my life in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. And you know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true. For you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people for every good work. Let me just pray. Father, I just pray that you would speak this morning because I feel like some of this information is like head-hurting information. It's, it's deep and we got to think a little bit and, and I struggle with some even a little bit as we prepared it, but I just pray that you would, you would speak here this morning and you would make it clear and uh, the Holy Spirit would teach because it says that that's what he does and so I pray he would do that this morning in Jesus' name. So Paul states in verse 16 that Scripture teaches us what is true. And truth (laughs) is an interesting and sometimes seems elusive concept to us. Can we really know what is true? Or is all of our existence relative to our own thoughts and understandings, our experiences, our emotions, our feelings? And if we can know what is true, who determines it? Who's the ultimate authority? Is there even an ultimate authority? And these are difficult questions that we watch a society in turmoil wrestle with day after day. A society that looks all too much like the first part of 2 Timothy chapter 3, which is ironic given what I want to discuss is the reliability of the Bible, and it's basically showing you that, oh yeah, it's reliable. And some of you may be ready to read the first part of the 2 Timothy chapter 3, look outside and goes, yeah, that's pretty accurate, and you're good to go. (laughs) But for the sake of those who aren't so easily persuaded, can I keep you from lunch just a little bit longer? The truth questions that we see in our society are not questions that our society alone has struggled with. If you study Greek culture for even just a smidge, you'll see that from like 600 BC to 300 BC, like a lot of their philosophy and a lot of the the thoughts that they gave us was them wrestling with the idea of truth and what they could know and how they could know it. These are not new questions that we have. And what I really want to focus on today is the idea posited by Paul in verse 16, that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. But see, truth is really the crux of what we need to discuss today because Before we even look at whether or not this book is reliable, we need to know if truth can even be known. And that's for two reasons. I'm sorry, that's the first reason. If truth can't be determined, the exercise in trying to determine if this is reliable is fruitless. Because we need to know whether a statement about truth can be true before we determine whether the book can be true. True? Okay. If true things can't be determined, it's senseless for us to try and determine whether this book is true. We need to know if truth is knowable. So Norman Geisler and Ron Brooks, they wrote a book. It's called When Skeptics Ask. And in there, they state that correspondence to reality is a philosophical prerequisite for truth and truthful communication. 
Do you realize that lying is impossible? It's impossible for you to lie without correspondence to reality or fact. They point out that if what you say doesn't have to match up to what you see or facts that you know, you can never be factually incorrect. You can never lie because there's no such thing as truth. And now there are certain situations where this may be helpful. Gentlemen, your wife comes to you and says, do I look fat in this dress? <laughs> it would be extremely helpful if in that situation you could not lie <laughs> because there's nothing that's true. And ladies, that question is totally unfair, by the way. This is a total aside. <laughs> it's not my message. That's an unfair question, right? Because I may think you look fat, but the person outside may not think you look fat, or we may both think you look good in that dress, and you go out, and your friend's like, girls shouldn't be wearing that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's totally in the perspective of the beholder. So let's stop asking that question. Anyway, <laughs> we know that lying is possible, and we know that real facts do exist. If I go to Chick-fil-A, and I order a spicy chicken sandwich, which is what I order when I go to Chick-fil-A, I have a certain expectation of what they're going to hand me. It's going to be a spicy breaded chicken breast in between a bun with two pickles and the pepper jack cheese that I added to it. And then I'll take the pickles off. I like the dill flavor, but I don't like cucumber. So anyway, <laughs> I, you didn't need to know that. <laughs> that's what I expect them to hand to me because that's what I ordered. If they bring out one of those plastic dishes with a salad in it, we're going to have a problem, <laughs> right? And philosophically, someone can say to you that they believe all truth is relative, and there are no absolute truths. So they would say that if they, the person handing me the salad thinks that's a sandwich, that's okay, because that in their mind is their truth. That's, that's their sandwich. And that salads and sandwiches are really just arbitrary terms that we as humans have given to those things, and they really don't exist. <laughs> and this can be done, people do this with time as well. They say that, you know, things that were true a thousand years ago are not true now because we know more. Well, no, we may have been revealed more and we may know more, but truth was still truth a thousand years ago. Just because they didn't have electricity doesn't mean that electricity didn't exist or wasn't available. They just didn't know about it. It was still true back then, even though they didn't have it. And the problem is when we state that all truth is relative and that there's no absolute truth, you've made an absolute statement. If truth is always relative, it's absolutely true that it's always relative, which means your statement's false. <laughs> and this type of thinking is it's cute when we want to switch salads for sandwiches. It's a whole lot less cute when we mutilate boys to try and turn them into girls. Okay? And when the rubber meets the road, the truth will always, always, always come out. Consider the statement that what's true for you isn't true for me. If you take a person that says that, and you both stand at the edge, and here's the train tracks, and you say to them, well, I believe if I jump in front of this train, I'm going to die, but that may not be true for you. Why don't you try it? I can't think of anyone, and there may be somebody, but I can't think of anyone that's going to jump in front of that train. Because it's always true, all the time, it's absolutely true that train beats body. It's absolute. And I can go on philosophically speaking, and we're only scratching the surface by discussing correspondence theory today, but it's enough to tr say that truth can be known if it corresponds to reality and that some absolutes must exist. And if thoughts and information can't be applied to and checked by reality, we can't really know anything. You can't know anything, because at that point, nothing is real. If truth exists, it also means that logic is a necessary prerequisite, because we have to have a way to think through those things and have knowledge. And if logic doesn't exist, what are we talking about? We might as well, <laughs> we might as well leave this room <laughs> and go, go to lunch. What am I saying? I don't know what you're going to get for lunch because when you order off the menu and you get a Salisbury steak, I don't know what they're going to bring you if logic doesn't exist. And since we know logic exists, I believe this shows that there must be a God as well. Because people try to make the argument that God doesn't exist because there's too much evil in the world. Well, that's a problem. Because if there's, if there's evil, if you assume that there's evil, there's, there's, there's definitely got to be good. 
And if there's good and evil, there has to be some way to differentiate between good and evil. So that's morality or a moral law. And if there's a moral law, there must be some authority that gave that moral law. But that's what you're arguing against when you say there's evil, is there's no one that gave the moral law. Well, if there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. There's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. What are we talking about? And that's not mine, that's Ravi Zacharias's. Logic exists and truth can be known. So the next question is, if truth can be known, how do we know it? Well, we said it, much, it must match up to reality, but how do we learn reality? There are two ways that we generally learn truth. Experience or reality teaches us what's true, or an authority teaches us what's true. And it's not enough for me to just tell you that. I have to give you an example. So I need a volunteer. Ross, you want to come up? Somebody else? Cole, come on up. Two of you, you can both come up. Cole, I'll let you do the experience part. How's that? All right. I believe you can fly. Do you want to go out on the roof and jump off and try it? No. Why not? Oh. Well, I still believe you can fly. Why don't you run and jump off the stage and see if you can take off? That was weak. Do it again. Try to fly. You can put your arms out? You're not going to fly without your arms out. Don't worry about them laughing. They're not looking at you. All right. So experience has taught you that you can't fly, right? Okay, you can sit. Thank you. Ross, come on up. Did you forget to tie them today? No, all right. Is that the style now? See, I buy them without laces. That way I don't have that problem. <laughs> that happens when you get old and lazy. Uh, so I have a different test for you. You ready? You ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to show you some stuff on the screen, and I want you to tell me what it is. Are you good with that? It's pretty simple. It's like a test. All right. So the first one's a color. All I need you to do is tell me what color is up there. Are you ready? Pink. He said pink. Does everyone agree that's pink? The correct answer is it's yellow. Why? What's the problem? Who told you it was pink? Everybody? Well, I'm telling you it's yellow, and I'm the pastor. So what color is it? It's pink. All right. I'm demonstrating the problem when we have authorities teach us different things. I have, I have an easier one. Colors are hard. Let's do a number. How about a number? What number is that? 15. Everyone agree? That's actually Jimmy. <laughs> Who's right, them or me? Why are they right? That's a tough question, isn't it? See, and you'll have people tell you that if we could get everyone in the English-speaking world to trade the, the idea that this is number 15 for the idea this is Jimmy, it proves that it's an arbitrary fact. Okay, but if you hire somebody at Jimmy dollars an hour and you pay them Bruce dollars an hour, you're going to have a problem because <laughs> things aren't arbitrary. There's truth to them. They need to correlate. They need to correspond. One more. These were hard. How about an easier one? I'm going to show you a symbol. And you just tell me what the symbol represents. It's pretty easy, right? Ready? What is that? What is that symbol for? He says it's the Dallas Cowboys. How many agree with him? This is actually the international symbol for failure. That's actually the right answer. Go ahead, sit down.
In case the Dallas Cowboys are watching, that is not the actual logo. I created that so you can't sue me, all right? That's a joke. But we had to use logic to make that joke, didn't we? It doesn't make sense if we don't understand some other principles ahead of time. And what was the real problem here? He had two different authorities telling him two different sets of information. One was true to reality, whether colors are humanly defined or not, it was true to reality for what we understand, and one was false. And this demonstrates the importance, the absolute importance, hear me, if you don't hear the rest of the message, this is what's important, of having the right authority in your life. See, you have the option to test every single truth by experience. That's an option you have available to yourself. I'm not sure how you prove pink, but you could do that. But see, most likely, if, if that's the way you tackle life, you're going to have a very short life. Because if, <laughs> it's a whole lot easier to have a trusted authority tell you, don't take a bath with your plugged-in toaster, than to learn that lesson on your own. You'll learn it, and it'll be the last one you'll learn. <laughs> right? Kids, don't do that. I've got to be careful what I say in these messages. <laughs> it, you'll only have that lesson once, and that'll be the last lesson you'll learn. So therefore, truth and knowing truth really comes down to which authority you trust. Because there will be a time where experience can teach you, but it'll be too late. Once the train hits you, it's too late to think, oh, that theory was poor right? And as we've seen, having the incorrect authority in your life can lead you astray as well. You need to make sure we're listening to the right authorities. And this really, family, is the crux, the whole crux of, of our existence. It's the, it's, as long as you have me up here, I will say this again and again and again. It always comes back to Genesis. It always comes back to the Garden of Eden. And when Satan tempted Eve, what he was really saying is, can you trust that authority? Or do you want to trust my authority? Which authority are you going to listen to? Because none of us are born knowing things. We know how to cry and get something. And even that's learned. Everything we know, we learn either from an authority or by experience. And that's why in this section of scripture we read today, Paul appeals to Timothy's teachers. In, chapter, in verse 10, you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. And then in verse 14, you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. And you've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. Paul is very much aware that those who teach us hold a powerful sway over what we believe and what we think and what our worldview is. He even tells Timothy, you know you can trust the truth because you trust the people who taught you. It's an inherent trust that we put in any teacher or authority we listen to. That's why you need to be careful who you listen to. It's why you need to test everything you listen to, even from this pulpit. I can make a mistake. Somebody else we put up here could make a mistake. It's also why the Lord says that not many of us should teach because you will suffer a harsher, stricter judgment in James chapter 3. There's a responsibility with those who teach. And by the way, the enemy's aware of this too. If Genesis isn't enough, you understand it by looking at the, the battleground that our schools and our universities are right now. It's also why it's extremely difficult to change the culture in, in, a, in a culture and I won't name any, but in any culture where our kids from young are up are indoctrinated with militant ideas, it's hard to change those cultures because it, they are taught it young. And it's also why the leadership of this church has identified not external ministry, but internally the, the ministry to our children as vitally important to this church. And if you are a Sunday school teacher or a leader in children on up, really, you are vital to this church. And thank you, by the way. And here's your bonus mini-sermon for the day, because I really could spend a whole lot of time on this, but if having the right ultimate authority in your life is, correct, is, is key because it can correct a misread experience. So if you have an experience that's negative, and we talked about experience teaching us things. If you have an experience that's negative, you could read into that the wrong lesson. 
And having the right authority can correct that lesson. So if you have a negative experience that tells you, you know what, I don't think God cares about me. I, I, don't, think he really, I don't think he really does. Or, or I wouldn't have gone through that difficult situation. But if your authority tells you that he loved you so much his son died for you, that corrects the negative experience that you had. If a kid hits a hole on his bike and falls off his bike and breaks his leg, he may think, oh, I, I don't really, I think the bike hates me. <laughs> I don't want to ride bike anymore. It's a terrible thing. But you as a parent can come alongside him and say, look, it's, it's just an accident. The bikes aren't bad. Everyone, go out and have fun. Just watch where you're going. <laughs> the authority can trump a bad experience. Now, finally, finally, I'm getting there. I'm sorry. Verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. This statement of Paul's is true, and it must be true of or prove wrong any book that claims to be from God. If God exists as creator, he is necessarily the ultimate authority. If you create anything, you are the authority over it. If you start a business, you own that business. You are the authority over it. If you have kids, I won't say you created them, but you are the authority over them. If, if you go to the beach and create a sandcastle city, you are the authority over the sandcastle city because you created it. You get to work it how you want to work it. So if there's a God who created this existence, he necessarily is the authority over it. And that's why Paul's statement in verse 16 is true, even if it doesn't reference the Bible, which it does. All of God's words are authoritative even if God were to write another book. He didn't. But if he were to, it would be authoritative because he's God. If it was to be discovered that God was actually Muslim or Mormon, he isn't, that book would become authoritative because he is the authority by virtue of creation. And since we've already seen that authority is one of the two ways that we learn things, and the better of those two ways, it makes, it, it makes you understand that, that it would be wise of us to discern what the truth is about what God says. Whether this book is in fact true and from God is vitally important. Because if he's the authority and that's the way we learn, this is the only way we can learn anything. Why did I start this series this way if we're just trying to determine evidences of whether or not the book is reliable? Here's the thing, it would seem logically odd to most of us to use statements from the, its own book to determine whether or not this book is true. Like, you'd probably want to try and use outside sources to determine if this was accurate. That's the way that most scientific discovery is. You don't use the object to determine, you use things outside the object. And ideally, we would use other sources to determine that. And we can try, and there are some outside evidences we'll look at, but ultimately you can't really do that with God's Word. And, and that's kind of the point I wanted to establish today. Because if God exists, there's nothing greater than Him, and there's nothing truer than Him, and there's nothing by which we can judge the ultimate standard because that's what makes it ultimate. And really, there's no way for us to know anything if God didn't interject and show us some things. So whether it's the Bible or whether it's some other book that God chose to write, it necessarily contains truth. And it necessarily must be used to prove its own authority because there's nothing greater by which to judge it. This is why the author of Hebrews says in, in Hebrews 6, verse 13, he talks about the covenant that God made with Abraham. And he says, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took the oath in his own name. Because how was God going to take an oath on any greater name than himself? And that's our point today. We as mankind have a problem as we try and prove what's true or what's right or what's from God. If we're going to prove God's word is true, there's no greater authority we can use than his own word. It'd be like if we, if we, were, if we were to be in some kind of lawsuit, and we went through all the court systems and the appellate courts, and we got it all the way to the Supreme Court. It's the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court makes a ruling. And we don't like the ruling, 
So we say, well, let's go appeal it to a lower appellate court. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The Supreme Court could change its mind. It's done that. But it, you can't take it to a lower court because it's the Supreme Court. It's the ultimate authority. All of man's ideas and judgments are imperfect. But God's judgments are all perfect. So how in the world are we as man going to be in a position to judge what is true? We have to use his own words. We can confirm it by experience, but we can't appeal to a greater authority. Now, that was a lot of information. I know. I'm sorry. But what I hope to do today was show you the necessity of having an authority and the right authority in our lives. Because many parts of society are suffering from a lack of authority or confusion. It's not just a lack. It's a confusion on, well, well who is the ultimate authority in our lives? And over the next couple of weeks, I want to look at how we can know that this Bible is, in fact, the Word of God, so you can trust it as your authority, as authoritative. And that's for us in this room, it's for the next generation, and it's for anyone who's suffering in this life with confusion from a lack of understanding about what truth is. And we need to go through it. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we get into things that that hurt our heads. I know when I try and think about eternity, (laughs) it hurts my head. Um, And some of this information is difficult but necessary. And uh, I just pray that over the next few weeks, you would show us how we can trust you. How we can know that this, this word is from you. And that we have an authority, most of all, that loves us like that we didn't even get into that today or that touch that what what a necessity that is or what a joy or what a hope that provides you know it's one thing to have an authority who just wants to rule over you it's quite another thing to have an authority who does everything with the heart of love and care and concern and compassion and we're thankful today that that's the authority that you are in our lives I just pray that over the next few weeks, you'd you'd show us that we can trust. As, As Paul said to Timothy, we can trust who taught us. I'm thankful for those who came before and looked into all these things and and gave us that information and that, that confidence. But most of all, I'm thankful that you saw fit to break through to a, a being or a species. I don't know how I'd say it, but wouldn't know anything without you. <laughs> you, just, you revealed to us the greatness and the awesomeness and the, the wonder of what love really is. And I thank you for that. And ask you to help us to walk in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Brought me from death to life. 
I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel where hope is found, the empty tomb still speaks. For death could not keep my Savior down. He lives and I am free, man. Now on my Savior I fix my eyes. My life is his and his hope is mine. For he has promised I too will rise. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. brothers and sisters one final thing fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise keep putting them into practice all you learned and received from me everything you heard from me and saw me doing then God then the God of peace will be with you amen We're dismissed.